Sticker shock in Apex, utility bills two to three times higher than residents expected after a cyber attack. We bring the error to local leaders to find out what gives. The sixth named storm of the season is spinning up in the Gulf. I'll show you how Francine could impact the U.S. and what we can expect here in the Triangle. Then, happening now, community members weighing in on plans to move Red Hat Amphitheater. We take you inside conversations with city leaders. Right now, here at 7 o'clock, people in one Wake County community are dealing with soaring utility bills. This after, you will remember a recent cybersecurity hack. We're talking about Apex, where some people are seeing their bills climb two, even three times higher than expected. Tonight, we're hearing from the town leaders there who are trying to address these concerns from the community. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Dan Haggerty. WRL Sean Gallagher brings them the questions that you wanted answered about this issue, including what's being done to fix it. The automatic doors at the Apex Town Hall are getting a workout today. Like the starting bell for a heavyweight fight. You gotta take your lumps and uh, figure it out or how Yeah, you... I'm gonna go in there and try to fight them and see what happens. <laughs> People like David Nunez unfolding their latest bill to an astonishing number. This one was a thousand. Two hundred and eighty three dollars previously. Now it's six eighty seven. It says six hundred and sixty eight. It came like five hundred and fifty dollars. They are telling me it's two months together, but it shouldn't be like that. It's 642. Yeah. They may be getting a paper bill that shows two or three months of payments. Randy Vosberg with the town of Apex says these bills are coming to a head after the cyber attack in July. While their systems were down, the town suggested people pay the same amount in July that they paid in June. But that was likely an underestimate for true usage. Vosberg says others may not have paid at all. So they're seeing totals for two to three months of services that are due now. I feel for everybody involved. We're trying our best to give the service that our residents deserve. Um, and and I, we're going to get through it and we're going to be stronger when we get through it. It's very upset. Yeah. I mean, you know, everything is price went up, up, you know, for food and groceries and everything. Sophia George was blown away by her bill. 642. She showed us she had paid every month since May and it was never more than $120. She says the town system does not reflect that. They, they cannot show the proof. Yeah. They're saying, you know, their system is down. That's not our problem, you know. Does the town know how many people have paid? We do, um, and again, it's we're building our systems back, um, so the data we're recovering, we're putting it together, um, and on a case-by-case -case basis, but we absolutely do have records of those payments. It's just putting the pieces together and explaining it. An explanation that doesn't sit right with George. But now I had to go discuss with my husband, and you know, we need to do something, you know, they need to fix their problem. To help families like the Georges, the town of Apex has created a payment schedule for some to help spread out those payments over several months to help soften the blow. They've also doubled their capacity to help deal with the influx of calls. Sean Gallagher, WRAL News, Apex. Boy, frustrating for people there for sure. So we are tracking right now tropical storm Francine in the Gulf. As you see it uh, turning behind me here, this storm is expected to strengthen in the next few days. This will cause major storm surge along the Louisiana coast, eventually bringing rain. China. Meteorologist Campbell in the WRL Severe Weather Center with some details on this cat. You know, this is just what you expect to see, unfortunately, during the month of September. And the tropics coming to life once again. Tropical storm Francine, stronger top wind, 65 miles per hour. And it is now forecast to strike then into a hurricane overnight. So the center is right in this region. The thunderstorm activity is starting to blow up again to the uh, upper right-hand side of it. And it's moving at about 7 miles per hour to the north-northwest. It is expected to kind of curve along the Gulf Coast throughout the next 48 hours with the landfall as a Category 2 hurricane in Louisiana on Wednesday. And then it moves pretty much due north after that and then falls falls apart as it's stuck between two dominant steering mechanisms. The model plots are in pretty good agreement on this. It's unlikely that we would see the actual center of the remnants make their way to North Carolina, but we could see a plume of moisture impact us along with some fronts once the system is no longer tropical. So let's take a look at future casts. We are expecting a hurricane at landfall on Wednesday. It should weaken into a tropical storm as it continues Thursday up Louisiana, following right along the Mississippi River and the Mississippi Valley. Valley, and then it just falls apart here. But once we get to the weekend, some of that moisture gets here and we will have a chance for a few showers stemming 
from Francine this weekend. I'll have a closer look at two other systems we're watching in the tropics. Coming All up. Right. Sounds good. Thank you, Kat. And I think I got my microphone working again. All right. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you again soon. Right now, city leaders are holding an open house to discuss plans to move Red Hat Amphitheater and close South Street. This is all just a, a brainstorming session looking for solutions with the community ahead of a vote that we're expecting next week. WRL's Julian Grace is live at Martin Marietta Center where this meeting is being held. And Julian, curious, what are some of the ideas you're hearing? Well, Dan, there are a lot of ideas out here tonight, and this is a show-and-tell session. Let me step out of the way so you can see just how many people showed up today to make sure their voices are heard in this project. Now, people are learning all about the project and how they will be impacted. There also will be three different rooms here. One will discuss the amphitheater. Another room will discuss traffic impacts and the development of a strollway. Now, tonight at 10 and 11, you will hear from people who are here who say the amphitheater is vital to downtown Raleigh. You'll hear more about what they have to say. And then you'll also hear other people who are concerned about the impact the amphitheater could possibly have on other communities. We'll have that for you all noon tonight at 10 and 11. Reporting for now in downtown Raleigh, Julian Grace, WRL News. A big, ambitious project. Julian, thank you. So let's get you caught up now with some of the other top stories that we followed for you tonight. Here are five things you should know right now. A carry man is accused of bringing a pistol to NC State University today, waving that gun in the air near a Chipotle on Hillsborough Street. Zachary Olson, you just saw him, he's, he's actually currently a Campbell Law student, allegedly told campus police he intended to kill someone. Prosecutors say he told a woman on campus that he was feeling the pain of sexual assault victims and wanted to get vigilante justice. Four Eastern North Carolina schools increased security today. This after a student made a social media threat. The Edgecombe County Sheriff tells us it was a 13-year-old middle school student who made those threats. Law enforcement officials and the school districts are working together to crack down on this. A woman was airlifted after an apparent dog attack in Moore County this afternoon. The sheriff's office saying it happened at a home on Edward Road in Star. That's where they found the woman with multiple injuries after an attack they believe involved several dogs. Three dogs are now in animal services custody. The woman is being treated. We're told she will survive those injuries, fortunately. The state Senate passed a bill to fully fund private school vouchers. The so-called Opportunity Scholarships provide up to $7,500 for families to send their kids to private school. It amounts to more than a quarter of a billion dollars in public money. The House is set to vote on the bill formally on Wednesday. We will let you know. Crews began taking down signage outside of PNC Arena today. No word on what the arena will be called in the future, but it is no longer going to be PNC. There is a trailer video for EA Sports NHL 25, a video game that, that offers a bit of a hint. We're not sure. The video shows a brief glimpse of the Hurricanes hosting Ottawa in that trailer. And at center ice, it's called the Lenovo Center. There's a meeting to approve some new naming rights and a contract for that on Thursday. Second gentleman Doug Emhoff and Minnesota's First Lady Gwen Walls stopped in Raleigh today. They both spoke to hundreds of supporters inside the Market Hall in downtown Raleigh. The stop was part of the Harris Walls Fight for Reproductive Freedom bus tour, as they're calling it. Both talked about what reproductive rights would look like under a Harris Walls administration. To defend reproductive freedom, not destroy it. They will make sure that people, not politicians, control their own lives and their own bodies. It's not just who's president and vice president. It's who your senators are. It's who your congresspeople are. It's who your governor is. It's who your attorney general is. It's who's in the state houses. You've got to take this power back. Emhoff and Walls spoke to a team of Harris Walls volunteer phone bank members before taking a couple of, uh, of the calls themselves to finish their visit to Raleigh. Neither former President Donald Trump nor running mate J.D. Vance had any public campaign appearances today. Vice President Kamala Harris is kicking off a battleground state tour, and it will start here in North Carolina. Harris will be in our state on Thursday. She's expected to hold rallies in both Charlotte and Greensboro. 
Tomorrow night, Harris and former President Donald Trump will meet for the first time on the debate stage. It is set for 8 o'clock tomorrow night, and you can watch it right here on WRAL. Next here on WRAL News at 7 o'clock, we're revealing the results of some of our exclusive WRAL news polls all week. We're going to be taking a closer look at what goes into conducting these scientific polls, from the process to the methodology to the safeguards that are put in place to ensure accuracy. That's coming up. Plus, a local 17-year-old pilot who just got his license got to meet aviation royalty. You recognize Captain Sully Sullenberger. I'm sure that story is ahead, and you only see it here on WRAL. Well, we're getting down to it now. Just 56 days from Election Day, and all week we're going to be revealing results from our exclusive WRAL news poll. Today, we are centering on the presidential race. Survey USA conducted this poll, and it finds that Vice President Kamala Harris is leading former President Donald Trump by three points here in North Carolina on the eve of the first debate between the two candidates. Ken Alper is here. He uh, he runs Survey USA. Joining us now to talk about really what goes into conducting these polls. Good evening, Ken. We appreciate you being with us. Absolutely. Let's talk about the process because people, of course, can make, they understand the results, but it's really important, I think, to uh, explain the methodology, the, the how you got these numbers. Absolutely. So for state polls like this, we conduct the research online using members of internet research panels, folks who've agreed in advance to take surveys. So, you know, 20 years ago, we were able to do this entirely on the telephone and enough people were still using landlines and still answering the phone uh, and participating. And as you know, that's not the case anymore. So we still use the phone when we need to for smaller projects usually. Uh, but for state level work, that's it's a lot more expensive to use the phone and it's no more accurate, no less accurate. So these folks are basically waiting to take surveys and uh, they get notified, they get sent into our poll questions, and then we apply some census data to those results to make sure that they end up being properly representative of the state. What we don't do is we don't try to apply our own feelings about who's going to vote and not vote. You know, there've been elections in the past where some polls have said, yeah, you know, we're not gonna include anyone who didn't vote in at least two out of the last three elections, that sort of thing. Or they've made assumptions that, you know, because the percentage of young voters was X in the previous election or because Y percent of the voters in the last election were African-American, that the next election is gonna look the same or it's gonna look different. We don't make those assumptions. We make sure that our data reflects what the census says the the overall population of the state is, and then we let people tell us whether or not they're voters. We always see the margin of error. When we see a scientific poll, there has to be that, that give or take one way or another. Talk a little bit about the, the fail-safes, the things do, that can ensure that these results are as accurate as possible when the people at home are, are trying to interpret what they might mean. Sure. So, you know, in, in the industry, we tend to talk not so much about margin of error, but we use a term called total survey error because we're not just looking at the most technical things. We're also looking at the most basic things, which for us, a lot of it comes down to what we've done since the beginning when we first started doing this in the 1992 election. And that's writing really clear questions that aren't biased in any direction, that don't slant the results either intentionally, which would be awful, or almost as bad accidentally slanting the results one way or the other. We want to make sure that our polling is as accurate as it can be because our, our whole job is to get the election right. If we get it right, we do well as a company. If we get it wrong, we don't get to work a lot more elections. You know, another part of that is working carefully with our vendors to make sure the people who are taking part in the online surveys are real and that they're reliable respondents, that they're not what we call professional survey takers, people who take, you know, too many polls all the time and aren't answering them seriously. Some of that is coming from the vendor. A lot of it, though, is our own internal checks where we're looking at everything from how long a given respondent takes to complete the survey, to making sure they're not giving us inconsistent answers, to asking them open-ended questions so that we're making them type something in their own words which really gives us some insight to make sure that we're, you know, looking at real people here and that we're getting data that we can feel confident and that you and your viewers can feel confident in. Polls are, are a very popular thing, uh, getting a pulse of what is happening, not just for the candidates and for the various parties, but for the voters at home. That said, because of their popularity, we see so many polls out there nowadays, and the scientific polls end up getting mixed in with the non-scientific polls in the eyes of some of the viewers at home. But I do want to specify the work that you're doing, and historically, you've seen a lot of accuracy with the polling compared to what the final result ends up being. 
That's right. We have a great track record. We're A-rated or A-plus rated, depending on who's doing the rating, and we are solidly up there. We've also done more public opinion polls on elections than I think anyone else in the database, because we've been doing this, like I said, since the 1992 election. All right, Ken, thank you so much. We appreciate you being with us, uh, explaining these very important results to our viewers at home. Uh, thanks for your time tonight. Absolutely. You can find more on these results and others right now on our website, WRAL.com, and we'll share new exclusive WRAL News poll results tomorrow starting at 4 p.m. as we take a, a close look at the race for governor. You can find out how North Carolina voters feel about those candidates and how they plan to vote tomorrow only on WRAL. And election season just happens to coincide with some of the most beautiful weather that we get throughout the entire year. Meteorologist Kat Campbell joining us now with look at, a look at how the week's going to go, Kat. It's one of those weeks. Get outside, get some fresh air. It's beautiful. Notice, though, the sky is very hazy today. We had a lot of uh, smoke from wildfires well to our north and west push into the area. It's in the upper levels of the atmosphere. It's not at the surface, so it's not a danger in terms of air quality. But it is enhancing the sunset. If you look at it in person, it looks very fiery, kind of a red orange glow to the sunset. Beautiful out of the deep app tonight. They're getting ready for their last home stand of the season. 75 degrees right now with the dew point in the mid 50s. If you are not doing anything during the evenings this week, it's just going to be a week where you'll want to be outside getting fresh air. This is going to be a great place to be tomorrow. First pitch is at 635. It'll be 79 sunny, but again, there could be a light haze in the air. 80 degrees on Wednesday and earlier first pitch at 105, partly cloudy Wednesday and then more clouds on Thursday. It's mostly cloudy 77. The good news is is that Thursday is bark in the park, so hopefully that helps to shade some of the pups out there so they don't get too hot. Tropical storm Francine continues to churn in the western Gulf. It's going to kind of track along this front initially before making landfall in Louisiana. For us right now, high pressure in control of our local weather. It is beautiful outside as long as we've got that high pressure right there. Once we get later in the week, we're going to be wedged. Uh, at least Francine will be wedged between low pressure to the west and high pressure to the east. And this is going to help to ensure that it's steered pretty much due north once it makes landfall in Louisiana. And it's kind of going to get stuck between these two steering currents right here. So it'll fizzle out eventually over the Mississippi Valley. And that's the reason why it's pretty unlikely that we would actually see the center of the remnants pass over North Carolina. And that means the heaviest rain would stay west of us, though we could see some of that moisture get lifted to the north into North Carolina. Still, we're looking at less than half an inch of rain over the next seven days, the way it looks now. A hurricane warning in effect for the areas in red along the Louisiana coast. New Orleans currently under a tropical storm watch. We're going to be watching that closely for you. A lot to watch with this system. Unfortunately, storm surge is going to be an issue. It's a slow mover, only moving at about seven miles per hour right now, and the areas in red could see over nine feet of storm surge. The current maximum storm surge forecast is five to ten feet, and we know storm surge is a big issue in Louisiana, unfortunately. Two systems that we're watching next. This one, a 70% chance of developing. Model plots actually available for this one with a 60% chance. You can see there at the end of the model plots. It's probably going to recurve out to sea, but we'll be watching that. It could be our next named storm, perhaps. 85 for the high tomorrow, 84 Wednesday. Once the clouds roll in, our highs drop into the the lower 80s for a few days, a 30% chance of rain both days this weekend, but it doesn't look like a washout by any means at this point, Dan. All right, we'll keep an eye on it. Thanks, Kat. So sports betting is, of course, growing in our state. We'll take a look at some new numbers out today, including how much North Carolina and North Carolinians, I should say, are winning next. One of the most celebrated pilots in the country has taken an interest in one of the newest pilots from Fayetteville. Captain Sully Sullenberger invited 17-year-old Tyler Moore to the museum that bears his name, Sullenberger's name, in Charlotte over the weekend. The pair took pictures, they toured the museum, and they talked about airplanes. Since his retirement, Sullenberger has been on a mission to encourage people of color and women to consider aviation as a career possibility. An airplane cannot know or care what color the pilot is or what gender the pilot is. All the airplane can know is what control inputs are made, and they must be the most skillful and appropriate ones. Sullenberger is an Air Force Academy graduate, and he is pulling for Tyler to take a similar path. A nice mentor to have.
New numbers show people here in North Carolina bet more money on sports in August than they did in July. August saw $370 million bet. That number was up from $340 million in July, which was the lowest that we have seen since the state legalized sports betting not that long ago. Those totals include regular bets as well as the promotional ones. People won more than $333 million. Licensed operators, so the companies like FanDuel or DraftKings, they set a new low in gross wagering revenue at $33.7 million. You can find more about this on our website, WRL.com. The Trans-Siberian Orchestra will once again bring its version of Christmas class classics to PNC Arena this holiday season. Oh yeah, that's quite the show there. It's, uh, it's part of the group's The Lost Christmas Eve tour. The show will be Wednesday, December 18th. If you're interested, tickets go on sale Friday morning at 10 o'clock. Thank you so much, of course, as always, for joining us here at 7 o'clock on WRAL News. Our next newscast will be at 10 o'clock over on Fox 50, and then we'll see you right back here on WRAL tonight at 11. A gorgeous shot of Carolina Beach. You know, I don't like that sun setting so early in the evening, but it sure looks nice around this time. Thanks for being with us. Have a good night. Keep watching WRAL News over the Air Channel 34 and Spectrum Channel 1257.